Well, my name is John Augustus Raffetto. I was a pioneering banker, businessman, and hotel owner here in Placerville. Uh, some of you may have visited or even stayed at one of my hotels. It's now called the Carey House. Or you may have parked your car at the site of my other hotel, which was located in that parking lot on the corner of Cedar Ravine Road and Main Street. That was called the Ivy House Hotel. But I'm getting ahead of myself. <clears throat> I was born in 1864 on my parents' farm in Newtown, which is located about six miles southeast of here. My father and mother, Domenico and Anna, they immigrated here from Italy in the 1800s. Now, to sustain ourselves on the farm, we grew winter wheat, uh, grapes for making wine, and we also raised animals. We would cut that winter wheat by hand. We would pile it in a circle and let our horse walk around on the top of it until it was crushed enough to haul into Pleasant Valley to be made into flour. Uh, <clears throat> after the horse walked on it, it was dusted off, you can be sure. Now my mama, she made macaroni with that flour. She would roll the dough out by hand cut it into thin strips and hang it on the clothesline to dry until ready for storage. She also made ravioli with that dough. We would save the brains of all of our slaughtered livestock to go into that ravioli filling. Yes, the brains. And if you've never tasted it, why it is, I can tell you, delicious. Now, it has been said that my father made a thousand gallons of wine a year on our homestead. <clears throat> uh, if, my, if my son were here, <laughs> Lloyd, he would probably lean next to you and say, my father exaggerates. But Lloyd is not here today, so you're going to have to take my word. <laughs> but anyway, he did make wine. And uh, on Sunday afternoons, about 50 or so of our neighbors would come to visit and uh, uh, sample and perhaps buy some of that wine. But it was not the wine that it was our major source of income. We relied almost entirely on gathering and selling wood for firewood. Oh yes, it was very hard to make ends meet in those days. One of our biggest customers was our Aunt Ida. Now she owned a bakery on Main Street, on the site of which is now Arian's Department Store and the Oddfellow building next to it. Now we would haul the wood down there. Ida had a huge stone oven on the outside of the building and they would put the wood in and of course get it lit into charcoal and then bake their goods. So as I said, it was difficult making ends meet. So in the summers, I would walk to Genoa, Nevada to work there in the wheat fields for $30 a month plus room and board, and I would manage to bring $60 of that back home. Oh yes, we needed every, every dollar of that money. Now it took me two days to walk the 90 or so miles to Genoa, and once I was so eager to get back home that I actually ran part of the way and made it home in a day. Now, uh, Lloyd may dispute that, but then Lloyd's not here. <laughs> now after that, I worked in the mines for $1.50 a day. And by 1895, my partner and myself had each raised $1,000 with which we bought a school in Placerville called the Conklin Academy. And we turned that into the Ivy House Hotel. Now at the Ivy House, we uh, rented rooms and served meals in the dining room for 25 cents. Later, 35, when the demand grew. <clears throat> now we were very fortunate, our greatest source of business came from the mines. Because the miners would come in for breakfast and then head out to work. And I looked at that and I said to myself, what are these poor men doing for their lunch? So I invented the three-tiered lunch. It was a round lunch bale with three sections. In the bottom was a sandwich, in the middle, cake or pie, at the top, coffee or soup. I was later told that some of those miners used that middle tier to carry the gold back home. 
Uh, who would suspect a man carrying a lunch bale would be carrying gold? Good idea. On April 22, 1912, uh, I'm sorry, 1896, the greatest day of my life, I married Adela Creighton under a horseshoe floral of ivy and lilies at her parents' Smith flat home. She stood there beautiful in a white gown of brocaded silk with uh, chiffon and orange blossoms. I was barely noticed, I am sure, standing next to her in my black suit and my white tie. <coughs> we celebrated that night at the Ivy House Hotel with friends and family. Adela gave birth to all six of our children at the Ivy House. Our three sons, Eldon, Lloyd, John A. Jr., and our daughter, Isadine, all thrived. I am sorry to say that uh, two of our infants did not survive. They are buried next to my wife and I. <clears throat> I don't know if I shared with you, but that big stone there, that's where my wife and I, Adela, are buried. <clears throat> if you look at it, you'll see, well, there's nothing chiseled on it. Well, that's because the chiseling is on the opposite side. It was believed at that time that all standing gravestones should face the rising sun each day. Consequently, it's facing east. <clears throat> now, the saddest day of my life came on February 9th, 1928, when my beloved Adela died after a short illness, leaving me a widower for the last 26 years of my life. Now Adela, when she lived, always insisted that our children go to college, and they did. And I would like to say that our children are her greatest legacy, and am proud to say that she does lie buried next to me. But I've jumped ahead of myself again. I'm going to go back to 1910. That was the year that I purchased the Carey House. Now, it had been built in 1857 of uh, wood and brick, stood three stories high, had running water, sometimes hot, for those miners who needed a good soak. There was also a Wells Fargo office in that building where the miners would bring their gold and have it shipped by stagecoach to San Francisco. Of course, in a Wells Fargo coach. <laughs> About three years later, I decided to tear down that old hotel and put a new building in called the, a new and more modern building, I should say, called the Placerville Hotel. <laughs> I should have called that the Lucky Strike Hotel. When they were building the basement foundation, we found enough gold ore and dust from the Wells Fargo days to pay for the foundation and the first floor. Well, I was so excited, I decided to buy my daughter Isadine a present to celebrate. Now, what she wanted was a brand new pair of shoes, but she could not decide on which of two styles she wanted. So, I, feeling flush at the time, I looked at her and I said, well, heck, let's buy them both. She was thrilled. It was not very common to own more than one pair of shoes back in the year 1914. Now, I ran that hotel until 1927 when my son Lloyd returned from a month-long business trip to Singapore. <clears throat> I asked him, would you be willing to take over management of the hotel for me? And he said yes. When Lloyd was in Singapore, he was very impressed with the famous and luxurious Raffles Hotel. So when he returned to Placerville and decided to remodel the Hotel Placerville, he decided to call it the Raffles Hotel. I suspect he did so because if you listen, the name Raffles and the name Raffetto sound very much alike. After that, I became involved in banking and politics. Now, I was one of the founding directors of the Placerville National Bank and served as its vice president. That bank once stood on what is now the location of the River City Bank on Main Street. 
I also joined the Placerville City Council and was fortunate to serve as city mayor in the 1930s. When I passed away in 1954, I had lived a full and a meaningful life. I would like to think that the Raffetto family name is still held in high regard here in El Dorado County.